up next, Mr. Terry Hedden, to bring you through our next session, which is about creating a sales engine. So enjoy. Wonderful. You know, those luminaries, I want to kind of recognize them again because it, it's hard to kind of understand what they do, but you're talking about people, and we have another one. There's a gentleman by the name of Terry Rossi is a luminary that was too shy and soft-spoken to get up front. Those are people that have paid for themselves many, many, many times over. Those guys are adding 20, 30,000 a month recurring to their revenue. It's not like a minor thing. They're, I would say, probably in the top 1% of MSPs in the world in terms of what they do. So you're gonna have time to network with them. There's lunch with the luminary that's gonna happen after this presentation. They're gonna spread out, invest time in them, talk to Terry Rossi, understand how he got where he got, uh, is now. He's about to become a very wealthy man uh, because he's about to sell his MSP, he announced today. Um, there's a lot of opportunity out there uh, for you to achieve your goals, and those are, those are you know, three plus Terry, four sitting here right now that can help you do that. So I encourage you to talk to them and find out more about how they do what they do. So at the end of the day, lead generation is, is more of a math equation than anything. It's not an emotional decision, it's a logical one. If you do what it takes to get a lead, you'll get a lead. At that point, the magic happens. Because what we have learned, um, we were, Mark II has been in business for seven years, okay? We've provided, I don't even know how many appointments, probably tens of thousands, I don't even know, because we're getting close to 1,000 a month right now um, that we give to MSPs and, and uh, vendors working with MSPs. One thing we've learned is that a lot of the sales processes that are, are in place now were ba based on word of mouth leads. At the end of the day, people have got where they are on word of mouth leads, they build a sales process that works. And a word of mouth lead is one where someone has literally put their reputation on the line to recommend you, right? So if it's a CPA that says, you should talk to Chad at NITOR, those guys are amazing. When a trusted advisor tells someone else that, that you're amazing, you're already on a pedestal. If it takes a 10 on a scale of one to 10 to close the deal, you're like starting off as an eight. So if you don't drool on the proposal and you don't embarrass yourself, you should win that deal almost every time. 75%, 100%, something like that. But a marketing lead is completely different, especially an outbound marketing lead. It's a completely different thing because they weren't even looking for an MSP. We called them, right? We called them and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working with Chad at NITOR, they're amazing. Um, you, you should talk to them and they're like, okay, well I'm not happy with the price, quality, service, they're not happy with something, I'm willing to take an appointment. But when you walk in the door, you're that guy who called them, right? You're that girl that called them. You are the person who put, called them and walked into their office. You're starting off as a one. Now they may have gone to your website, they do. They want, may have gone to your social, they do. They may have checked you out by asking some friends, maybe looked at your LinkedIn, and seeing that you have some common connections, you might get to a two, to a three, to a four in that process, but you're not walking in an eight. So what you have to do is to change your sales process to be one that's built on generating the trust required to get into a long-term managed service agreement. So we're gonna talk about a sales process that you can deploy today to improve the probability of closing every lead you have, not just normal marketing leads. You'll increase your average deal size, You'll increase your close ratio and you'll increase your margin because you will make them want to do business with you because you provide a compelling value proposition and you create urgency in making that decision. So we're gonna go through that right now. At the end of the day, what we want is for you to be in the top 10, 20% of your market in terms of price and we want you to sign three and five year terms with annual price escalations and auto renewals. We want the contract to be assignable so that when you go to sell, your business is worth a lot. When I went to sell my MSP, so it took me six and a half years to get to about 500,000 a month in recurring revenue. And I started with nothing, and there was no Marketopia. I had to do it all myself, right? It was really difficult, um, and you know, I didn't have any money, so it made it even more challenging to kind of bootstrap it. What I learned is that You've got to get them to want to do business with you, to trust you more than the next person, to believe in you more than the average MSP, because the average MSP is competing on price, and they stink at service, and they don't deliver on the promises, right? So you've got to differentiate yourself. You've got to build more of a trusted advisor status. You've got to know who they are and who they are as a company, right? The individual, who are they and what's their, what's their need? What's their, 
what's their, their game in this, right? Are they looking to get promoted? Are they looking to not have to worry about technology? What exactly are they in for? Same with the company, where do they stand? Are they trying to be the next company that gets acquired? Are they trying to grow? You've gotta learn about them and their problems and their goals. You've gotta figure out where they are as business people and where they are as individuals so that you can figure out how you're gonna help them achieve that. You've gotta know where they wanna go so you can tell them how you're gonna help them get there because what you're not is a computer repair technician. What you're not is a computer fixer. What you are not is a customer service professional. What you are is a wind at their back. You're gonna leverage technology to help them achieve their business goals and objectives. You're gonna help them achieve their dreams by not having to worry about technology because you've got it. The process that we like to go through, and you'll notice nothing starts in the sales process until you have a lead. It is crazy to expect your sales team to generate your appointments. Okay, salespeople stink at marketing. They don't do it, they don't prospect it, they'll fake it. Some people are, proud, are not too proud to admit that. Some people fake it because their boss is expecting them to generate their own leads. Our sales process believes in a very specific role and that is that a closer is different than an opener. There are two completely different personalities. Marketopia has an army of openers. Why? Because openers are hard to find, hard to motivate, hard to retain, right? They're expensive, way more than you think they are, and they're worth their weight in platinum because they'll generate far more leads than any one of us has the patience and tenacity to do ourselves. I don't know about you, but the our callers are averaging around 2,000 outbound calls a month. 2,000, 500 a week, 100 a day. I don't know about you, but the chance of me making the 100th call in a day is a long way from 100%. Why? I get frustrated, I get bored, I, I start to get defeated. They have to take rejection. They're working their butt off. They're making those 2,000 calls to maybe get six appointments, or eight appointments, or 10 appointments. It isn't easy. So what we're assuming here is that the salesperson has walked in the door. Right, guy walks into a bar. That's how the process starts. Now, COVID introduced a, 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 an inconvenience that we're trying to really adapt, and I'll tell you, some people, specifically NITOR, for example, has mastered this initial phone conversation, but most MSPs are getting tr tricked up by it. They're having trouble getting past that. And the reason is, they're people, and they rely on friendships and teamwork and building trust and rapport, and they're charming, and they're good talkers, and they wanna walk in, and they wanna walk around and notice things about the tech and look at the server room. They're struggling to get past that initial phone conversation, but we're gonna talk about how you get past it. Then you go to the business technology assessment, which is when a business uh, technology advisor, a business consultant, goes and talks to the customer without a tech, okay? And then the technical assessment happens, and then the proposal happens, and then hopefully, you get to a contract. Now, when you look at this, I will tell you that most customers now, when they come to Marketopia, struggle in here because they have a word of mouth sales methodology. They're getting through phase three because someone else put their reputation on the line, right? Someone that's your current customer or your current referral partner. Marketopia's biggest customers struggle getting past step one and step two. And so we really build a lot of sales training and a lot of energy and peer groups and a lot of things around helping people get through this process because the only time when you want to lose or win is at the last step because at that point you've gathered all the information about that customer and presented it back to the customer, why they should be concerned, why they shouldn't sleep at night, why you're the best partner for them, why you're the only partner to them, and why they should be paying more for a better product than what they have today. That's in the proposal and presentation. That's when you want to lose a deal. Because some people, you're not going to win them all, right? We, like you, we want you to win 25 to 50%. So let's kind of dive in. That initial phone conversation that so many people are starting with now with COVID is, is really a trap. What most MSPs think is that they're going to try to qualify this customer and make sure it's worth their time. So they're going to try to talk about price, they're gonna to try to find out if, if it's worth driving an hour to their office. They're gonna to try to qualify the customer to make sure it's worth their time. They're also allowing the customer to qualify them. 
They're talking about price. They're talking about service. And for goodness sakes, if you're one of those customers that thinks you can get $250 a user, this isn't when you talk about it. You're crazy. You know you're crazy. You don't want to talk about it until after you show them how amazing you are. The goal of the initial conversation is simply to get on site. You want to introduce people to your services at a very high level. You don't want to talk technical at all. You want to convert them into someone that's interested enough to invite you on site. Your goal is to convert 95% of those initial conversations into on-site appointments. Now, if geographically it's a challenge for you to go on site, I'm all about it. You could do it remotely, but keep the meeting purpose built. Your goal here is to get to the next step. Because the next step is we're going to start gathering the information that you need to justify them hiring you. This is just a screener. So you don't want to say anything stupid. You don't want to do anything stupid. You don't want to ask them anything stupid. You don't want to disqualify them. And you certainly don't want to get yourself disqualified. That is all you're trying to do is to get into the first meeting. Your goal is 95% conversion. 5% of the time, they're like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were a janitorial service. That happens, right? Sometimes you say MSP. They literally think you do like some other thing. So 5% of the time, you know, they're not worth continuing. But it should be a very small number. I used to say 100% of the time, but I've learned that's not perfectly reliable. Now, if you say the wrong thing, if you do the wrong thing, if you answer questions the wrong way, this number can turn into 5% quick. If, you, if they say, how much are you, and you say $250 a user, this gets to zero in two seconds. So what you have to do is to answer questions that don't get you fired, that don't get you filtered out. You say things like, much like a doctor, it's very difficult for me to diagnose the patient until after I check them out. I need to come in and learn more about your business. I'm not like everybody else. It's not a one size fits all, one, pro, one, one plan fits all. I need to get to know you and your business, and then I will architect a solution designed specifically for you. And that could cost anywhere from 10 to $200 a user. And they're gonna push you because they don't wanna waste their time. Well, wait a minute, what would it be if I included blank, 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 and you still come back with the range? Because your only goal is to get on site. Once you shake hands, kiss babies, show them how amazing you are, show up early, look good, smell good, act good, well, the chance of you winning the deal goes up exponentially. You have to get on site. So don't disqualify anyone. If they're too far away to be worth your time, fire yourself. If they're too far for your service team to service, different issue. But what we're seeing is salespeople think, yeah, man, it was an hour away, and I wanted to get back for my kids, and ah, this and that, I don't want to be from the office. Fire yourself. If you don't have enough time to give your prospects the time that they need to make the decision, you need to get a new salesperson. You don't have enough bandwidth. And then don't be disqualified. Don't say anything or do anything that's going to get you canned. Don't talk about you're crazy. Everyone's got a crazy. If you're $250 a user, you're crazy. You don't want to bring that up until the very, 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 very end when you show them how amazing you are and how much value they get in your $250. But if you're a random customer who's got a $60 a month per user MSP right now and you talk about $250, you're out. So you can't talk about that crazy. Do not say anything to be disqualified. Don't be late. Do your homework before the meeting. Be prepared for that conversation. Learn about the person you're talking to, the company you're talking to. Be ready, show up on time, and do nothing to hurt yourself. Your goal is to get to the next thing. I also talk about aggressive promotions. One thing that we've learned is that MSPs tend to have this inflated sense of self. Right? Hey, listen, much like a CPA, I don't discount my services. Your, C your CPA might charge you six grand a year, and there's no at all requirement to continue. There's no contract at all. You're asking for a three and five year term. You're asking for a half a million dollars. You better believe they're expecting a deal. We like to see people offer very aggressive promotions to get the appointment. When I say very aggressive, it might be a steak dinner, lunch, Starbucks coffee, a Yeti mug, something for the appointment. Right? Because you've got to be worth their time. And they don't know if you're worth their time, so you want to give them some sort of a prize for meeting with you. And ideally, if you're smart, it's some sort of swag that sits on their desk that reminds them of you long after they're gone. 
because there's two sales cycles, as I learned from Jeff yesterday. I thought it was brilliant how he talked about in our peer group yesterday how he sees two chapters of sales. There's the deals I close in the first 90 days, and then the deals that I close a year later when they realize the person they went with other than me is not as good as me. And if I can get my swag on their desk with a Yeti coffee cup or some sort of notepad or something, a mouse pad, well, they're going to see my name every single day a hundred times and be more likely to call a year later when they realize they made a mistake. So get aggressive in your promotions. Give it to your lead gen source. If you're offering a free Yeti coffee mug, it's a $45 thing-ish, something like that, which is a bargain for an appointment. You want to talk about that up front, because you might get people that would normally not give you the time of day to let you come in their office and get an hour of their time. So get aggressive. Same thing with new customers. We talked about the value of a customer, the value of a lead, right? I think it was a customer was worth $37,500 in that little example. Hopefully you did that exercise yourself to find out what a customer is worth for you. And you'll start to realize, wait a minute, if it's worth in profit 40 grand, I'm happy to give them two months free. People tend to be so skimpy with their promotions. Like, no one buys a, a brand new car and pays sticker. Maybe right now, it's the first time in your life. Most of the time, it's 0% financing, some sort of a no payments, sign and drive kind of thing, right? There's some sort of promotion, because it's a big decision. Everyone wants to feel like they got a deal. So you've got to offer aggressive promotions. You, in this phase, you just want to say whatever it takes to get to the next meeting. You never lie, you never cheal, steal, you don't ever take advantage of the trust that people place in you, but you don't say anything stupid either. You just get to the next meeting. Don't want to avoid money, um, offer ranges, and then as you get down the process where you learn more about them and their business requirements, well then you can start to narrow what it is you're going to recommend. You're going to start being able to talk about what's right for them. At that point, you go on site. You leave the tech at home, okay? Why? Most managed services decisions have nothing to do with technology. It's all about the partnership. If you're a good MSP, and I don't think you'd be in here if you weren't, you're not competing based on who has the best engineers. You might think you have the best engineers, just like everybody else in here, which, of course, mathematically, only one person has the best engineers. But bottom line, what you've got to do is compete on partnership. Go to the vendor, in the, you're at IT Nation, you're at the best collection of vendors in the world. Walk out there, and what you'll learn is that, that different AV providers are no longer saying, I've got three features they don't have, I've got three widgets they don't have, mine blinks pink and their blinks green, you should buy mine, it's better. What they start to say, if they're smart, is they're going to compete on partnership. Because at the end of the day, that's what you're looking for, is someone who's going to help you achieve your goals. And let me tell you, that's exactly what your prospects are looking for, too. They want help achieving their goals. They're sick of worrying about IT. They're sick of having crappy IT. And they're sick of IT being a wind at their face when they're trying to move their business forward. So your meeting needs to have a business conversation. You're going to bring someone there that hides their tech if it's tech and doesn't bring an engineer ever. Because as soon as you get into speeds and feeds, you're competing with every other MSP in the world at the same game. And that game is price and that's not where you want to be. What you want to do is to show up and listen. God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. You've got to listen because they will tell you what they want to buy. They'll tell you what, why they hate their current company, why they like them, why they, what they're worried about with you, what they're not, what they're dreaming about, and what they're scared of. They're going to tell you everything that you need to know to win. And the beautiful thing is they're going to forget that they told you, and you're going to regurgitate it back to them when you deliver the presentation. So you've got to listen here, you've got to take notes, you've got to ask a series of questions about everything technology in their business so that you learn about their pain points and their dreams. You want to lead with a deep understanding of their company and their goals. And most importantly, you want to leave with them knowing that you get it. You understand them. You've listened, you've learned. You're developing a, a knowledge of their business that's going to make whatever you say next more trustworthy. If you think about it, if I walk up and say, you should buy the F-150 Lightning, you're going to say, whatever, dude, you don't even know me. I live in Manhattan. I can't drive an F-150. It's not logical. But if I listen to you and learn, man, you, you're moving, but you're, you're in Manhattan now, but you're moving out to rural New Jersey, and you're going to buy a fixer-upper, 
and you love doing Fixer Upper yourself, I'm going to start having great examples that I can throw back at you to justify buying the F-150 Lightning. It's a $90,000 car. But if you, if you don't listen first, you're not going to get the information that you need to justify the purchase of a $90,000 car. People shut off. Think about you. You ever had people give you unqualified advice? They don't know you. They don't know anything about you. So when they say something, you don't even listen to them. You just turn off. You're like, whatever, dude. You don't even know who I am. You know nothing about me. Even if they're right, you're still not going to listen to them. So you've got to get to the point where they know they've been heard. And you've got to arm yourself with all the information that you need to justify them paying a premium for your service and for them committing longer than they ever thought possible for your service. Your goal there is to get at least 90, 95% of those to convert into the next step. So again, you're not saying anything stupid. You don't have enough information to quote them yet. You know more information than when you walked in there, but you don't even have a technician. How could you possibly be expected to quote anything? You haven't looked around. You're listening and you're understanding the business side of this decision, the business side of why, not the technical side of why. You've got to earn the right to send an engineer in there. Now, some of us use rapid fire, some of you use other tools, some of us do it the old-fashioned way because customers are concerned with you installing something on their network. All of these are valid approaches. As long as you get the skeletons in the closet that they didn't even know they had. Because they, they're going to tell you the skeletons they know about in that first meeting. Hey, listen, service stinks. When we call for support, it takes them four days to get there. Our server's been down three times in the last 90 days. Right? We got hacked. We got a ransomware attack. We got something. They're going to tell you that. But what they don't know is that their router switches and firewalls are end of life. Their backup hasn't occurred successfully in three weeks. You're going to find all of the things they didn't know about to, once you get the engineer on site. So you've got to earn the right to get there. You've got to earn the right to get to the next step. Before you come there, do never show up at a customer and ask a question that you could have figured out on your own. You want to show up looking like you did your homework. You get it. You understand. You understand their business. You understand their industry. You understand the regulations that they face. You understand the market. You're prepared. And the magic, honestly, is when you start thinking about the person. Because when you look at their Facebook or their Twitter or their whatever, Instagram or any of these other wonderful things we call social media, you'll learn a lot about somebody. You'll learn that they like the Pittsburgh Pirates and their kids plays Little League Baseball and that their spouse works for General Electric. And the reason you do that is because you're going to show up and you're going to ask them questions that they magically are interested in talking about. You're going to build rapport because you're going to be talking about them. You're speaking magic to them. Oh, you're going to talk about your affinity for Little League Baseball. Even if it's not quite as strong as theirs, that's what you're going to talk about because then you're going to have something to, to break that ice and start getting that conversation going. You're going to do your research on the person, the company, and the industry to show up prepared. The average MSP shows up with zero preparation. Tell me about your business is their first question. That is one of the first times you're going to truly differentiate yourself. You're, with a process like this, you're going to differentiate yourself. You're not going up there showing up with a proposal ready to sign it. You're going to listen first. This is another time where you're going to show up and, like, you care. You understand. You get it. You know a lot about them. You also want to make an first, amazing first impression. It's super cheap to look, smell, and be amazing. Right? Just dress nice, show up five minutes early, be prepared for the conversation, well-groomed, look like you're a trustworthy person. Because we want them to see you like you see your accountant and your attorney, someone that's a trusted advisor. If they trust you more than the other guy, they're going to go with you more than your fair chair. And then, of course, we're still not in the phase where we talk about price. We don't know. We haven't done the technical assessment on site. We're still in that business conversation. So I'm not going to talk price to them. The traps that you get into, a lot of the over objections to getting to the next step of the process is by getting into technology. There's no reason to have another conversation if you've already brought the tech and you're talking about Barracuda and Office 365 and speeds and feeds and gigahertz and megahertz. You're going to avoid that conversation by basically being that business technology person. Listen, I'm a strategy kind of person, more of a CIO than I am an engineer. What I'm going to do is help make sure that your, your IT is a wind at your back instead of a wind at your face. That will resonate with them and help focus that conversation on getting you what you need to win. They're also going to try to avoid talking about technology that you may or may not know. 
And how you do that is to basically talk to them about how technology changes. Partnerships shouldn't. What the best, right now Office 365 is arguably the best collaboration platform in the world, but that could change today. So they shouldn't necessarily make their decision on who is the best technology provider for their infrastructure today. What they need to look for is a partnership, a company who's gonna evolve as technology evolves, who's gonna be there to support their needs today and tomorrow in their current size and twice the size that they are today. Everything's evolving, you're a true partner, you're not a typical technical vendor. I think I can change the power cord here. At that point, you're going to start bringing in the engineer. You're going to have that engineer come with you. Now, you're going to still come because that engineer is going to focus on the engineering, and you're going to continue to focus on the business and the relationship. So you're both coming to that technical assessment. Now, at that point, you may have rapid-fire tools. There's some other technology out there. Anybody have anything other than rapid-fire tools that does a similar thing? No one? OK. It's a great technology, but there are others out there that are escaping me at the moment. You're going to bring that technology out there. You're going to take and, and have your network engineer, someone that's really good, take a look at their environment. Router switch, firewalls, backup, everything they possibly can. They're looking for skeletons. They're looking for things that they're going to use to establish fear, uncertainty, and doubt over the current solution. You see, if they realize that what they have isn't good enough, they're no longer going to expect you to beat the price because you're going to have to bring a solution that's better than what they currently have. They're no longer as concerned about price as they would be. In that meeting, you're going to continue the business conversation. You're going to talk about the printers and their copiers, their phone systems, their website. You're going to talk about things that your company does and things that you would never do. And the reason is very simple. You want them to perceive you as a strategic advisor for all things technology. You want them to come through you for every technical need they have, whether you're talking about websites or phone systems or really anything. That technical assessment is going to give your engineer what they need to, to create an honest assessment of their business. You're going to gather the business side. You're going to focus on the relationship and the partnership and justifying and listening and learning. You're going to start meeting some key players during that walk around, hopefully shake hands with the decision makers, even if you came in through the influencer or the gatekeeper. That technical assessment is how you're going to get the technical side of the justification to hire you. Oftentimes, the urgency comes from that as well. Sometimes you get into assessment and you realize that they're playing Russian roulette with their network. Their backup hasn't been successful. There's a major problem. You may even find a, something on the dark web or maybe a ransomware attack has already happened, right? There may be things that you find out during that conversation, but at the end of the day, you may not. And we're gonna talk about, and we get to the, the proposal process, how you're gonna offer a promotion to create that urgency. Because sometimes it's the fear of missing out that makes people make a decision versus fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So that's that sort of technical assessment. Any questions so far? So we had the phone consultation, we had the business technology conversation, and we had the technical assessment so far in the sales process. Any questions so far? Rapid fire tools? Um, it's a great system that basically, what would you call it, scans the network to look for vulnerabilities. Patch levels, backups, um, lots of different things. Com rogue computers that don't have the right operating system on it, something like that. There's a lot of, it's a, it's a really cool technology. It'll be out there, I'm sure. You'll find them, they're orange. They're wearing orange, they're booths orange, they're orange. Yeah. Two. There's just two. You, the business technology advisor, what you might call a salesperson, business technology consultant, business technology advisor, is complemented by a solution engineer a senior engineer, because that salesperson has got to put that engineer on a pedestal. This is the best engineer in Jacksonville County. This is the best engineer in Pennsylvania. I'm bringing you the best of the best. Why? Because I want to understand what I'm getting myself into, and I want you to make sure you understand what you, where you are today and help you get where you're trying to go. So you're bringing in one person. Now, there's an exception. 
In that business technology conversation, if you uncover other things, like let's say a print and copy opportunity or need, and you have that service, you might bring in that person and do an assessment for that part of the business. Same thing with voice over IP. What you want to do is to really focus on specialization, both because you're going to show them that you're an army, you're not just one person, but more importantly, you've got deep specialization in each individual area. And that's going to give them the opposite of what most MSPs do, which is I'm a jack of all trades. I'm a sales guy, I'm a tech, I'll do this all by myself, I don't need anybody. As soon as you do that, you make yourself a little tiny mom and pop shop. Right? You want them to see the army behind you. You want them to understand that this managed services proposal is way bigger than one person. You've got an army behind you. Now that army might be ConnectWise Continuum overseas, that army might be 50 engineers near knock. The reality though is that, that one of the things that differentiates you from the trunk slammer and from the internal IP is that army, is that specialization. So you don't want to cover that up by giving a master, a jack of all trades, master of one kind of feeling. Any other questions? All right. My, it's still not booting up here. I let the battery go all to dead, dead. So once you have that technology assessment, then you focus on that presentation. Now, all of these phases should happen at least a day apart. Because there is a phenomenon with the human psyche where your relationships develop without any logic or occurrence of happening because of the subliminal mind. You're reflecting on the conversations that you have with people, and you're building a relationship with them. And the best example I always get is if you're trying to talk to someone at the gym, like let's say you're single and you find another person, if you walk up to them in the gym, it's kind of creepy. But if you see them in the produce section the next day, all of a sudden you can say hi and no one thinks anything about it. That doesn't make any logical sense at all. Nothing actually happened between those points, but time happened. So you want to leave and come back. By doing that, you're changing the, the, the setting, you're changing the purpose of the meeting, but you're also showing them that you still show up on time, you still look good, smell good, act good, right? You're still better than their current company because now you've shown up to three meetings on time, right? So you show up on time, you come in, and you First, you want to set the stage for the event. Ever since we left your office, I couldn't wait to get back here. And the reason is simple. I am concerned. If you found skeletons in their closet they didn't know about, you want to be able to talk about them right then and there. You want the engineer to present their findings in such a way that they're creating fear, uncertainty, and doubt. They're establishing supreme credibility in terms of their ability to resolve the issue. And then they stop talking, which for a lot of engineers is the hardest part. Engineers love to talk. The reality is the reason they're going to hire you isn't just technical, but you have to prove that you can handle the technical side. The reason they're going to hire you and pay the premium that you're going to charge is because of the partnership, all the other things you learned about. So when you're going through your solution stack, you're going to intertwine contextually relevant examples in the presentation. You're going to talk about Janet's computer and Bobby's downtime and the sales meeting that, they, that resulted in not winning the deal because the computer died. You're going to talk about how upset people are because things are slow. You're going to literally be there to help them understand that working with you as a technology partner is going to help them achieve their business goals and objectives. So then you're going to present that proposal, but of course, hold the price. You want to make sure that they get how amazing you are. You want to make sure that they know how well you listened. They want to know that you want them to know how special you are and how you're a real MSP and whatever jokester they had before you is not. And that's why they have the problems that they have. You want to make sure that they understand how much you've invested to become amazing at doing what it is you do because you're about to see the downside of that, which is price. And they're also going to see the downside of that, which is that partnerships take commitment. You'll never find a month-to-month -month partnership. That's not partnership, almost by definition. That's a vendor. That's like how you buy gas. There's no commitment. They're not, you're not a partner with your gas station. None of us are even loyal to a brand. We don't just go to Exxon. We don't, certainly don't go to one Exxon, right? So we've got to justify that. We've got to justify that partnership and selection with you. We want to justify how amazing you are. So we're going to make sure that we've resolved all their concerns. And they're going to be baiting for that price. They just want to know the price if you've done your job right, because you're going to have shown them already 
how much better you are than everybody else. And then it gets to price. And at that point, you have to turn into what's called an assumptive close because there's no logical way that they can ever not go with you because you've proved to them how you're better in every way. You've used contextually relevant examples to explain how this service will keep Janet's computer from freezing up, how this service will keep Mike with IT support 24-7, 365. You're going to justify how amazing you are before you talk about that price. And at that point, you present your price. You turn it into a presumptive close. You even stand up and you point to the signature line or ask them if it's okay if we send the digital signature now because you want to get started immediately. That solution engineer becomes anxious to start. You've created the environment where the only logical next step is to sign the contract because why would they want to go to sleep tonight without a backup? Why would they want to talk to another provider when you've already shown how much better you are than everyone through the process that you go through as well as the services that you offer? As Andrew talked about, you've had an amazing proposal, amazing marketing collateral, amazing sales process. You've looked amazing, sm sounded amazing, smelt amazing. You've shown them how good you are, and now it's about getting started. So at that point, you're going to present your price. You've already shown the value of what makes it different. So if you are one of those people who wants $200, $300 a user, you've shown them all the amazing things in that bundle before you told them how much the bundle is. If not, you know, they're going to compare you to their current company. Oh, it's also gold. You're gold, they're gold, they're 100, you're 250, no thanks. When in reality, your gold, of course, has nothing to do with their gold. So that's that solution presentation. Any questions or comments on that? Now, you have to look better than everybody in every step of the process. Perception is reality. People think in this business that they compete on service, but not one single person in here competes on service. They might compete on service to keep a customer, but even that's a fallacy. You think no one in your market's as good as you? Give me a break. The reality is you compete on perception. That's all you compete on. In fact, is an Apple Macintosh any better than a PC? Their marketing, sir, is. Apple does a much better job than Microsoft in marketing, and that justifies how much is a MacBook Pro is two grand, three grand, four grand now, right? A PC, you can still get a really nice one for a thousand bucks. It's a very different thing when you start competing on perception. Prestige, quality, support, value. Uh, security now is a big differentiator as well. You've got to compete on differentiation. You've got to compete on perception. That is the only sustainable competitive advantage in our business. There is always someone who's going to do it cheaper than you, perhaps even better than you. But if you control perception, you will win far more than your fair share. You'll get them to commit to a longer term, higher price point, which means higher margins. You'll, you'll get them to buy the services that you know they need. Right now, security is a big deal. It's expensive to do security now, right. But you know what's also beautiful? It's the highest margin thing we've had in this industry in a long time. Those luminaries up there that you talked to today have 75 points of margin on their security stack. It's no joke. They're doubling their profit just by selling monitoring and some sort of SOC service as well as some sort of a, um, endpoint security that's more advanced than the old stuff. Perception matters. How am I doing on time here? Questions? All right, we'll go through this little thing. All right, our goal with a proposal is 80%, 75% close rate. That's the only time when it should really drop. And the reason why is because you're not going to compete on price. You're competing. You're now competing. If they're talking to you, you they may be talking to three other people. So you want to make sure that you're charging the right price where you can make a fair profit. And by a fair profit, I mean 10, 15, 20, 25% net profit. You don't want to win 100%. The only way you can win 100% is charge less than everybody else. And this business, that's a quick path to the, to the unemployment line. There's always someone who's willing to charge less than you. People will charge less than what it takes to do it right, and they will literally kill themselves to deliver service because they don't have enough people because they can't afford it. Keys to, un to success in getting more than your fair share of proposals comes down to truly understanding their needs and challenges. You've listened better than the other people so that when you present your solution, it's going to hit home more. 
They're going to believe it more because they know you listen. You've actually intertwined examples that they told you into your presentation. They're going to perceive you as being the expert and the trusted advisor, not just on fixing computers, but providing a technology platform that their business can succeed and grow. You're going to then talk about the fact that you have the solution. Because those people that are charging nothing are still pushing an antivirus product as a security tool. They're not pushing next-gen security like you are. You've created that perception that you are truly the only one who understands their business enough to be listened to, to be trusted, to go with as a partnership. Some of the keys to success, number one, is to invest in marketing and sales collateral that makes you look amazing. You will be amazed at how much more confident a salesperson is when they're proud of their marketing and sales collateral. You want to have a great proposal template. And don't think of brevity as greatness, because it's not. One thing that Ernst Young told me is people value things by pounds. I literally put a 50-page proposal on someone's table for managed services. Literally. I've done it thousands of times. You've got to show that you're more valuable to the other person. If you're having a two-page proposal and they have a two-page proposal, I don't care what words are on it. You compare that to me coming in with a 50-page proposal, and you're like, listen, two things. First of all, we deliver. We have a lot of services bundled into ours. It's not some sort of a pray that we're on the same page kind of situation. I've documented what we do and what we don't do, what you've got included and what you don't. I understand your business. I've recommended a solution that's right for you, and it's comprehensive in nature. This is real. This isn't little kids and MSPs anymore. You've graduated from that. Congratulations. You're ready to get in the big leagues and work with a real technology company. We talked about hiding price till the end. I think that's a critical success factor. You don't want to lose based on price until after you've finished everything you have to say. At that point, OK, now let's talk about it. Right? I want to show how amazing I am and then talk about my crazy. Don't bring that up front. Make sure you get everyone on board. Make sure when you actually get to presenting your solution that you get the decision makers in the room. That gatekeeper, that influencer, I'm a believer in playing that game. Some of our customers shoot themselves in the foot by refusing to meet with anyone of the decision maker. And I'll help them understand that you've got to earn that right. No one's magically embowed you to someone who's worth the CEO's time. You've got to earn that right. You've got to get through that gatekeeper. You've got to get through that influencer. You've got to earn the right to present to the CEO. But once you get to the presentation, the proposal, you should have earned that. That's one of the beauties of the nurturing process. The sales process is to earn the right to talk to CEO. At that point, you're going to reiterate the value of what you offer, and you're going to close 25 to 50 percent. You're not going to leave money on the table. We had a conversation about that. A lot of MSPs do. If you're going to offer a discount, you're never going to offer it off the monthly. You're not that stupid. Te guys, costs are going to go up drastically in our business. They already have. I've heard rumors that ConnectWise is passing on some increases. I don't know, heard 40%, I don't know. It's big. Inflation is real. I heard that 6% is the new number, baloney. It's 25% out there. Your salary is going to go up, your costs are going to go up, every single one. You've got to make sure that you've got flexibility in your contract to offer a premium price. You can't discount the monthly. If you're going to discount, you're going to take it in the chin today. I'm going to give you one month free. Two months free, three months free, 50% off the first six months, something in the here and now. You're going to localize your damage at a point where you know you can handle it. If you don't need to hire a tech to service that customer, you have a lot of power because your costs have to go up nothing for you to generate more revenue. So you can give 90% off the first three months to get the deal, and you're still winning. You generated revenue and no additional cost. But you haven't damaged 2022 revenue, 2023 revenue, 2024. Remember, I'm in five-year contracts, automatic price escalations annually, and automatic renewals. That's the game I play. That's the game you should play, too. Don't confuse the roles in the process. Make sure you have established subject matter expertise with your engineers. Your business technology advisor is there to translate business requirements into technical ones to serve as the intermediary between the technical team and the business team. At that point, I also really recommend trying to transition managed services customers to an account manager. A closer in managed services is the most valuable person in the entire company. They're the ones that put food on everyone's table. 
A good managed services salesperson, some of these people, these luminaries you talk to, these sales guys that are putting 30K a month on RMR, guys, they're adding $360,000 in value to your company in a month. They're worth a lot. A great managed services salesperson should make 150, 200, 250. Should never cap their income because you want to give them a million dollars a year. Because if they do that, they're giving you 10. They're giving you 20. Salespeople are really important. So separate the farming. If, you're, if you have a great salesperson going after a $50 memory chip, you're doing something wrong. You want that, fifth, that big high-powered high closer to be focused on closing. You'll hear some of these, the luminaries talk about how the few salespeople they have, and people are just blown away. They're not like superpowers. They're not literally working 1,000 hours a week. They're focused. Their job is to close deals. Their job is not to quote memory chips or new monitors, or escalate a service issue. They're slick back, club them over the head, throw them into the cave, run back out and get the next one and do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Give them account managers. And then make sure those account managers are focused on upselling and cross-selling those customers. Nothing is stickier than a customer where you do everything. To fire you, they gotta get a new copier person, a new phone person, a new everything, you have got to stick your relationship there. And that's also where you're going to make most of your money. Once you close the managed services deal, the lion's share of profit is in your pocket for five years. So you got to go get more managed services revenue, like security. 75 points of margin, you're charging $30 for a security stack right now, let's say. You're putting $20 in profit in your pocket per user per month. Your cost of sale is next to nothing at that point because they're already a customer. If you, do, if you have $20 a user and you have 5,000 endpoints, how much money are we putting in our pocket? There are smart people smarter than me. What's the math? I'm adding $20 in net profit and I have 10,000 users. How much money am I putting in my pocket? 200 grand a month. Stop screwing around. Go after all of your customers and get that security stack. It's good for you. It probably will mean the future of your business because every one of us know how dangerous things are right now with ransomware and the social engineering attacks. It's also really high margin, so have their account managers focused on that. So kind of wrapping up here, if you want to win in managed services, you've got to win more than your fair share and you can never compete on price. You've got to build trust, irrationally high trust in a short period of time so that they believe in you and believe what you say more than everybody else. You've got to impress them in every step of the way. If you have a Bush League business card, you're being stupid. If your website stinks, you're being stupid. If your social feed is not good, you're being stupid. If your sales proposal is weak, you're being stupid. Invest in impressing them in every step of the way because if you're perceived as being better, you are better. You can't compete on reality until after you get the deal. Therefore, it's irrelevant. No one cares how good you are. You gotta look better than everybody else. Number three, take it one step at a time. Stop trying to skip steps. You're not, killing, you're not doing anything but shooting yourselves in the foot and leaving money on the table. You want to win? At the end of the day, I like to win. I'm not the guy who says charge 300 bucks a user. I'm the guy that says let's grow 50% for the next 10 years in a row. That's what I want to do. I want to win. I've learned when it comes to selling your business, those lifestyle businesses that make a million top line and 200,000 bottom line, those aren't worth anything. They were three to five times earnings, and you start looking at yourself, wait a minute, I can just work for three more years and I'll get the same thing as selling it? What's the point? If you're growing at 50% a year and you have for 10 years in a row, these luminaries that are literally adding 30K a month RMR into their P&L, they're worth a lot. Because it's not the technical part they figured out. It's the growth part. And that's what most of these businesses want. And then finally, patience pays off. You heard about the tsunami of, of leads, and I kind of cringe a little bit because everything takes time. Marketing takes time to produce leads, but more importantly, salespeople take time to learn how to close them. So you'll see that you have to be patient and let things work. Listen to your trusted advisors, follow their advice, stop putting the guards up and not listen to those that are trying to help you. If you find a good technology partner, you're tr looking out for your, their, your customer's best interest. It's not all about the mighty dollar to a great MSP. They care about their customers. The same thing happens in sales and marketing. Any questions? No questions? Man, was that good? 
Guys, at the end of the day, I want you to win. There's a lot of people in this business that will literally give you snake oil and tell you that the path to success is charging $300 a user, and I will tell you that that is the path to a lifestyle business that doesn't grow. The only way to achieve 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollars in valuation is to grow, grow, grow. If you want your company to be worth 500 grand, yeah, you could do that with a lifestyle business. You're basically selling a job. Hey, come in, I'm the sales guy, you could be the sales guy too. If you want to make 20, 30 million, you want to be worth something to a strategic buyer, you need to have figured out the entire business, not just the technical aspect. You need to be able to talk to anybody who has a dream of being an owner of a business and say, you can step in and do my job. I'm not responsible for sales, I'm not responsible for service. I'm a business owner. You could be a business owner too. So take your pension, cash it out, and give me 10 million and let me sail away to the Caribbean. I want you to win more than your fair share. I want you to achieve your goals personally and professionally. That is why Marketopia exists. When I sold my MSP, I, I grew to 49 people in six and a half years. I never had any money. I, when I sold, I, I retired, I was done. I, started, I came back to help people make a difference. And I'll tell you, that's what all these luminaries in here do as well. They invest a lot of their time and energy in helping people just like you achieving their dreams. So enjoy your lunch with them. They're gonna spread around um, and, and just talk to them, listen to them, learn from them. Uh, they've got a lot of wise things to say. Thank you. Let's give Terry some love.